welcome. Be sure to like and subscribe for more scary stories. Or I will come for you. I'd like to thank Elizabeth Jane for joining the Curator's Disciples. Your viewership is very much appreciated. If anyone would like to become part of my Disciples for an early and ad-free listening experience, the link is in the description below. Story number one. Never hack a hacker on the dark web. By the Curator. It all started my sophomore year at university. Me and my best friend Jake had been inseparable since we met during orientation week, our freshman year. We were both total geeks from small towns who hadn't had many friends growing up. But we hit it off right away over our shared loves of video games and coding. Jake was even more of a stereotypical nerd than me. This scrawny kid with thick glasses, braces, and a mop of curly hair that he never bothered to comb. His personality was just as awkward and dorky as his look, always rambling about weird software nitpicks or Tokien lore. I was definitely the more social and well-adjusted of the two of us. But what Jake lacked in social skills, he made up for with computer genius. Dude was a straight-up savant when it came to programming and hacking. Just had a preternatural mind for code and system. Most of the other computer science kids looked up to him like a legend, despite his goofy persona. Me, I was more into the big picture theory and security side of things. But together, Jake and I made one hell of a duo. His coding wizardry combined with my strategic thinking. We started doing little hacking projects together for fun, pretty much as soon as we became roommates. Just silly beginner stuff at first, like exploiting vulnerabilities in dumb websites or services. But over time, we got more and more ambitious as our skills sharpened. By the end of our freshman year, we were starting to poke around the seedier sides of the dark web, always looking for trickier systems we could try to compromise. That's just how we got our kicks putting our hacking talents to the test. Jake was always the one pushing us to take it further, to go deeper into the dark realms of the internet. He got a bigger thrill from it than I did. Meanwhile, I was getting more and more paranoid about having the feds bust down our dorm room door or something. But Jake always talked me into keeping at it, saying no one would catch us if we were careful enough. So when that human trafficking hell site fell across our radar at the start of sophomore year, we just couldn't resist taking a look. Jake was the one who found it first. As usual, combing through the darkest corners of the web late one night while I was trying to sleep. But the second he showed it to me, I knew nothing would stop us from trying to crack it. It was a Friday night, and we were bored in our dorm room. Jake was scrolling through some shadowy corners of the dark web, like he always did when he said, Dude, you need to see this. I leaned over and there it was. A human trafficking website with the most insane security I'd ever seen. Holy shit, I said. We have to try to get in. Now, in hindsight, that was pretty messed up of us to be so cavalier about something so evil. But at the time, we were young and stupid and just saw it as the ultimate challenge. Obviously, there's no justifying that kind of thinking, but that's just how our messed up brains worked back then. So we got to work. Jake started mapping out the server infrastructure while I tried brute forcing potential login credentials. We'd done stuff like this before on smaller scale sites, but we could tell right away this was an entirely different beast. Every time we felt like we found a crack in the code, we'd hit another roadblock. Whoever built this had covered every angle. We tried every trick and technique we knew. Brute force attacks, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows. But nothing made a dent. After a full week, we hadn't even managed to get past the homepage. Maybe we should walk away from this one, 
I said as I slammed my laptop shut in frustration. But Jake was obsessed. He'd hardly slept or eaten. He was so focused on cracking this code. I'd never seen him work so hard on anything in his life. No way, man, he said in a daze. I'm not giving up until I get in there and fry those bastards. I should have walked away right then, but the challenge had gotten its hooks in me too. So we kept at it day after day after day. We ditched classes. We stopped seeing friends. We barely left our room. Our lives revolved around trying to hack this impenetrable website. Then one night, maybe a month after we started, we had our first breakthrough. Jake had discovered a tiny backdoor vulnerability in one of the site's remote server locations. It wasn't much, just a little peek behind the curtain, but it got us jacked. We ramped up our efforts even more, alternating between mapping out the site's full architecture through that backdoor vulnerability and probing for other cracks we could slip into. We started leaving notes and diagrams all over our dorm room like a couple of crazy people. Finally, after almost two months, the big breakthrough came. I'd discovered a way to upload a harmless virus through the back door Jake had found that would replicate and spread through the site's servers. It wouldn't cause any damage, just leave a door open for us to sneak through. The moment of truth came late, one Saturday night. We uploaded the virus and waited with bated breath. At first, nothing happened and we thought we might have to start over from scratch. But then, just when we'd started to lose hope, we got a notification. The virus had spread and deactivated the site's firewall protections. We're in, Jake yelled, pounding his keyboard furiously. My heart felt like it was going to beat out of my chest. We scanned through page after page after page of disgusting human trafficking content. Pics, vids, ordering info, pricing, the full revolting meal deal. And all these poor girls and women caught up in the trade, totally dehumanized. It made us sick to our stomachs. But we didn't have time to process that yet. We were on a mission. Jake encrypted and downloaded every tiny piece of data on the site while I worked on deploying the virus code that would fry every server once and for all. By dawn, the site was completely nuked, just lines of garbled code. We'd brought down the biggest human trafficking operation on the dark web all by ourselves. We were exhausted, but feeling pretty good about ourselves. We just pulled off one of the biggest hacks in internet history and helped save who knows how many lives. We did it, man, Jake said, cracking open a beer to celebrate. But then the severity of what we'd uncovered started to sink in. We were just two dorky college kids who'd stumbled onto an incredibly violent global criminal network. If these people ever found out who we were, Jake's face went pale. Oh, shit. Oh shit, he kept repeating under his breath as he sucked down the rest of his beer. We spent the next few days utterly paranoid, barely leaving our room, convinced that human traffickers were going to break down our door at any second. We almost considered going to the cops and turning over the encrypted data, but we were so freaked out about getting implicated in the whole thing that we kept our mouths shut. After about a week of living in constant terror, we finally started to relax a bit. We figured that since the site was just a scorched wasteland at this point, the people behind it would just cut their losses and move on rather than trying to track us down. Jake reformatted both of our hard drives to cover our tracks, and we went back to our normal lives, trying our best to put the whole thing behind us. Or so we thought. A few weeks later, strange things started happening. I'd open my laptop to find the screen plastered with disgusting images I recognized from the trafficking site. Files started randomly going missing from my computer. I started getting flooded with spam emails from weird accounts. At first, I thought it might just be a virus or malware, but Jake was experiencing the same exact issues. 
Then one day, right in the middle of class, a projector in the lecture hall kicked on and started broadcasting some of the most horrific human trafficking videos you can imagine. The classroom went into pandemonium as people started screaming and the professor called security. When I looked down at my laptop, I had a message window open with the words, You can't hide from us forever. Jake and I booked it out of there in a panic. We tried tracing the IP address and online footprint of the attack, but it was completely cloaked. That's when the phone call started. Just heavy breathing and muffled voices at first, then increasingly darker and more sinister stuff. Like recordings of people screaming and asking for help. We pulled our SIM cards, but they just started calling our laptops through VOIP services. Needless to say, we were completely losing our minds at this point. We didn't feel safe anywhere. Not our dorm room, not classrooms, not even the goddamn library. We stopped going to our classes completely out of fear and didn't leave our room for days. Needless to say, we were completely losing our minds at this point. We didn't feel safe anywhere. Not our dorm room, not classrooms, not even the goddamn library. We stopped going to our classes completely out of fear and didn't leave our room for days at a time. We tried reporting the threats and harassment to the campus police, but they thought we were just a couple of deranged kids wasting their time. Then one night, I woke up to Jake, shaking me awake in a cold sweat. Dude, oh my god. Dude, you need to see this, he stammered, grabbing my arm and pulling me over to his laptop. He'd been up late, scouring the dark web when he found it. A video feed of me sleeping streamed from a webcam in our dorm room. At that moment, a notification popped up in the video feed. Nice try, taking us down, but we're still here. A wave of panic shot through me like I've never experienced before or since. Jake and I just kind of blacked out, packing our bags and getting the hell out of there not even caring about our classes or credits or anything. We spent the next couple of weeks couch surfing at friends' places, too freaked out to tell anyone what was really going on. But they always found us. More weird messages and emails, our personal information being leaked and spread around. At one point, someone even posted my social security number on a sketchy message board with the caption, this guy is dead. So we ran out of places to go and people to turn to. Our money was dwindling. We were skipping all our classes. We were so strung out on fear and lack of sleep. That's when Jake had the idea that would be our undoing. He knew a way we could scrub the internet of every trace of our identities. Every photo and record that tied us to our names. All we had to do was activate an encrypted virus he'd been developing, one more potent than we'd ever used before, and we could essentially erase ourselves from the web and start over fresh somewhere these sickos would never find us. It was a long shot, but at that point we were desperate enough to try anything. So we holed up in a CD motel room and got to work one final time as Jake booted up his virus program. He had me install the virus first to test it out, since he'd worked so hard coding this thing. As the virus started doing its work, wiping me from existence online, Jake was grinning and hitting keys with glee. We're actually gonna get away with this man. Those trafficking scumbags will never. His smile disappeared as something flashed across his screen. Wait, no, that can't be right. He started frantically hitting keys, sweat beating on his forehead, but it was too late. The virus had turned. Instead of scrubbing our identities, it started rapidly uploading and sharing all our personal data across hundreds of sketchy websites. Emails, passwords, social media, banking info, you name it. In the blink of an eye, our entire lives were leaked out onto the dark web. No, no, no. Jake cried out, 
realizing too late he'd been the one to screw us over. The full weight of my panic and exhaustion finally hit me, and I just collapsed on the grimy motel room floor, too drained to even be scared anymore. That's when my laptop started glitching out, flooded with notifications from hackers and criminals taunting us. Nice try, boys. You can't beat us at our own game. And there it was, the final insult. The website we'd worked so hard to take down was back, reconstructed from the encrypted files Jake had downloaded, with both our names and info posted as the masterminds being offered up for a huge bounty. We were caught, squeezed on both sides by the human trafficking guys and the hacker crews we'd inadvertently ratted ourselves out to. There was nowhere left to turn, no one who could help us. So we just sat there in that damn motel room, two idiot kids who'd gotten way over their heads, waiting for whoever was going to come crashing through the door first. Looking back, I'm kind of amazed the cops ended up being the ones to actually arrest us. They just thought we were tied up in some low-level identity theft operation, not a vicious global human trafficking network. We tried explaining what really happened, but they didn't buy it for a second. After all the chaos, Jake and I were both just happy to finally have a jail cell to feel safe in as we awaited our utterly bogus trial. So that's how I ended up here, facing hard time for cybercrime charges that don't even begin to capture the full nightmare I've been through. My once brilliant buddy Jake got hit even harder. He's in for a decade before parole's even an option. We're just a couple of dumb, tech-obsessed kids who kept chasing after a challenge we didn't fully understand until it was way too late. I'm honestly just lucky I didn't end up at the bottom of a desert ditch somewhere after pissing off those human trafficking guys. This jail sentence is the best thing that could have happened considering the hornet's nest we stirred up. Story number two. Embracing the disorder. A hitman's story. Looking back, I can't really blame anyone but myself for how things turned out with my life's path. My OCD tendencies were obvious from a very young age, as early as four or five years old. I was already fixated on particulars, like arranging my toys in specific patterns and freaking out if anyone touched them. My parents tried their best, taking me to a stream of psychologists and behavioral therapists while I was growing up. They put me on various meds too, in attempts to manage it all. But my brain always seemed to be working against those efforts, the compulsive urges and need for rituals overpowering anything else. School was absolutely miserable. I'd have these overwhelming repetitive thoughts constantly looping in my head, distracting me from being able to focus on lessons or interact normally with the other kids. They thought I was just the biggest weirdo freak. I'd come home every day and instantly snap into my instinctive routines, organizing and rearranging things for hours to satisfy my need for order. My only escape was diving into books, video games, coding, anything that provided set rules and procedures to obsess over instead. I became one of those born in the wrong generation kids who thought they were smarter than everyone else. Just very few friends, no real social skills, and mind working constantly over time. My poor parents felt so helpless, watching their only child recede further and further into himself. We'd get into these huge screaming matches over my refusal to compromise on my routines, my inability to face uncertainty or spontaneity. I'm sure it was frustrating as hell having to tiptoe around my condition all the time. Looking back though, they did the best they could with the shitty hand they got dealt. We just didn't really understand mental health back then, especially for a disorder as inscrutable as OCD. When all those therapists and meds inevitably failed, they just kind of gave up pushing me and pulling me out of my rigid shell. 
It's not like I ever caused any actual trouble, though, outside of being a moody loner weirdo. I wasn't violent or getting into crime or anything. I'd just kind of robotically go through the motions until graduating high school. Managed to get into a decent state college, too, as much because of my academic obsessiveness as any intelligence. College was just more of the same, my OCD alienating me further from any normal social development. I'd skip classes constantly if I didn't feel right that day or if my rituals made me late. Was basically a shut-in outside of my obligatory attendance, routines and coding becoming my entire life. My one attempt at the classic college experience was crashing and burning spectacularly. Everything finally came to a head my junior year. One of my routines caused me to seriously overreact and threaten a classmate I thought was touching my things. Campus police got involved. I went off on them too when they tried restraining me. Ended up getting expelled and having an involuntary psych hold. That proved to be an unexpected turning point though. For better or worse, it snapped me out of the daydream of trying to have a normal life. The professional assessments at the treatment facility confirmed I was never going to be a functioning member of society, working some ordinary 9-to-5 career. The OCD was here to stay as a permanent factor. So, in a weird way, that whole incident was actually freeing. It meant I didn't have to keep fighting against my nature and urges anymore. I could simply embrace them, find healthy outlets to pour my obsessive focus towards. And that's exactly what I set out to do when I got released, forge my own path while managing the OCD instincts rather than trying to repress them constantly. I didn't really know what to do with my life. My grades were terrible because I could never focus in class. But I knew computers inside and out. I tried getting a normal IT job for a while, but my OCD was so severe that I'd get fired from every job for being too inflexible about procedures or falling behind from getting caught in my rituals. I started doing freelance computer work over the internet instead. It allowed me to make my own schedule and not have to explain my weird habits to anyone. But I was barely making enough to get by. That's when I discovered the dark web markets. There was good money to be made there if you had useful skills. So I started offering my elite hacking services anonymously on a few of those markets. My first few jobs were getting into people's email accounts, laptops, things like that. Mostly for corporate espionage, it seemed like. It paid well and seemed pretty harmless, so I kept at it. Eventually, darker job requests started coming in through the markets. Things like hacking into government databases, planting backdoors, etc. One day, I got an encrypted message from someone looking to hire a hacker for a house cleaning job. Complete discretion assured. Substantial payment. They seemed to be using a anonymous routing service, so I had no way to trace who sent it. But my curiosity was piqued, so I responded saying I was interested in asking for more details. A few days later, I got a big file transfer with all the details I needed. The target was some mid-level manager at a tech company. They had his full identity, work details, family info, everything. Along with very explicit instructions for getting into his computer systems, planting some kind of virus, and then gaining physical access to terminate him with zero collateral impact. When I first read that, I'll admit I freaked out a bit. This was way beyond the kind of shady stuff I had done before. But then I took a breath and really thought it through logically. Here was a client, completely anonymous, offering to pay me an absolutely insane amount of money for one job and it seemed relatively clean. Simple too with the provided instructions. No risk of innocent casualties. Just one target. So after careful consideration, I accepted the job. Looking back, 
I think a big part of my willingness to do it was the challenge it represented. The level of planning, the procedures involved. It was like the ultimate fix for my OCD. Something to finally fully obsess over and get exactly perfect. I spent weeks going over every aspect of the mission, sticking to the laid out plan but optimizing it over and over. My ritualistic mindset actually worked in my favor here. I was able to identify and work around every potential complication well in advance. Finally, the time came to actually execute the job. I had worked it out down to the minute. I traveled to the target city, got a rental car and hotel room under an assumed identity, used a VPN to scrub all my internet connectivity. Even acquiring the tools I'd need to complete the job involved an obsessively thorough process of custody chains and deconstructing to cover my tracks. My rental car too was rigged out with a special compartment to conceal everything. The day of the job, I barely slept. My OCD rituals were in overdrive, and of course, complicated by needing to actually follow the mission procedures too. It took me three hours just to get dressed and load up the rental car that morning. Three hours. Can you imagine? But that's me. I had to do everything in a very specific order, deterministically. Driving to the target's neighborhood, my heart was racing, but in a good way, not out of fear, really. I was just so excited, so focused. All my planning and preparation paying off. I got into his neighborhood, found his house, and then drove around the block a few times, just surveilling the area. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. A few of the target's neighbors were out doing yard work, but no one gave me a second glance. Just another random car on the road. Parking a few houses down, I waited and watched. After about 45 minutes, my target pulled into his driveway alone. Perfect, right on schedule, based on his workday routine. I gave it a little bit longer, nerves building with anticipation. Then I slowly and carefully got out the car, pulling on my thin black gloves. I already had my face covered. Retrieving the equipment case from the special compartment, I started walking casually towards the target's house. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw one of the neighbors glance over at me, but just kept walking purposefully, giving a little wave like I was making a delivery or something. She seemed to accept that and looked back down at her gardening. Getting to the target's house, I saw his car in the open garage. With my free hand, I rang the doorbell. No answer after a couple rings. Taking a breath, I then tried the front door. It was locked, of course but I knew it would be. Quickly pulling out my tools, I was able to get it open in 30 seconds flat without making any noise. I slipped inside, closing the door behind me silently, made my way through the living room, avoiding the windows. Up ahead, I heard the target's voice coming from the kitchen area. He was on the phone with someone it sounded like. Yeah, yeah, things are good here. Just got home from another bullshit day at the office. What's new with you? My hands were shaking slightly, whether from nerves or just eagerness I couldn't tell. Following the sound of his voice, I entered the kitchen. He was leaning against the counter, back turned towards me while he looked out the window above his sink. The phone receiver was against his ear, a beer bottle next to him. I'd be lying if I said I didn't hesitate for a split second. This was it the actual moment even after all my preparation it finally felt real but then i steadied myself the weight of the tools in my hands providing an anchor creeping forward i swiftly clapped my gloved hand over the target's mouth while wrapping my other arm firmly around his chest restricting his arms he dropped the phone letting out a muffled scream and jerking in surprise the beer bottle knocked over rolling away across the tile. I wrestled him back, away from the window view, my grip locked on him like a vice. If he hadn't been so startled, 
He could have fought me off, maybe. But he was disoriented, and I had him completely controlled from behind with his larger frame. Make a sound. So help me God, and that's it for you. I snarled under my breath. Surprisingly, he actually went still and limp, allowing me to march him over to the prep counter area. Slamming him face down, I was able to get my toolkit open and ready. He let out an almost pitiful whimper. Looking down at the back of his head, I realized this was the first time in my life I was this close to taking another person's. No. Focus. I took a deep breath, forcing my mind to clear, grasping at the internal rituals and procedures. You've done the prep. You know what to do. Follow the steps. Complete the mission. With renewed determination, I got to work on the back of his head while he squirmed impotently underneath me. I could tell the very second he realized what I was doing based on the violent shudder of his whole body. After I got that part done, I rolled him over to face me. He was crying and blubbering like a little baby, snot and tears all over his face. I grabbed him by the collar of his shirt and snarled shut it. He went quiet, except for some whimpering. I looked him dead in the eyes and said, you're going to do exactly what I say if you want to live, understand? He managed a little nod, eyes wide with terror. Good. He was becoming compliant. Made the next part easier. Following the rest of my steps, I worked on getting the virus planted into his computer setup in his home office. The whole time, I kept him zip-tied and in plain view. Couldn't risk him trying anything stupid to jeopardize the operation. Once that was done, and triple checked to my satisfaction, it was finally time for the last piece. This was the part I had meticulously planned out, going over the procedure in my mind more times than I could count. No mistakes allowed. I marched him out to the detached garage, not caring about the noise anymore. Got him inside and over near the work table area. That's where I had set up everything I'd need for this final meticulous task. He saw it and started freaking out again, blubbering please. I pistol whipped him across the face, snapping, can it? This was a professional job, you piece of shit. Anyways, I worked efficiently, referring to my written checklist that I pulled out of my vest. Followed the disposal procedures to the letter. It was messy, but I was clinical about it, keeping my distance as best I could. When it was over, I double checked that everything was taken care of properly. No trace left behind. Taking one last look around the garage, I felt an immense wave of relief and satisfaction. I had done it. Executed the entire mission flawlessly. Not a single step out of place. For once, my OCD had been an asset allowing me to navigate the situation perfectly. As I closed up the garage and headed back out to my vehicle, I remember feeling strangely at peace, like my mind had finally found an approved routine to latch onto and fully complete. No nagging whispers of doubt or urges to redo anything, just a pure sense of calm. Driving away, I couldn't stop grinning to myself. Who would have thought that channel disorder into something so fucked up could actually help treat it? Obviously not a permanent solution but getting that periodic release from successful jobs was invaluable. See, in my line of work, you have to be extremely cautious, never getting arrogant or lazy. Every job is a new chance to prove myself, to indulge my OCD rituals on the highest possible stakes. That's what gives me such a twisted sense of pride and satisfaction, following the steps, doing it clean, leaving no trace. Anyways, that first job was a long time ago at this point. I've done quite a few more cleanup gigs since then. Even worked my way up to getting hired occasionally by government agencies, extremist groups, criminal syndicates, etc. They pay top dollar for an anonymous professional who leaves no loose ends. 
One job that really sticks out in my mind was a particularly brutal contract I got hired for by one of the Mexican cartels a few years back. This Sicario ringleader reached out to me through some black market connections, looking to hire someone to send a clear message to a rival gang. The target in this case was the entire family of a mid-level lieutenant who had supposedly been skimming profits from the cartel's operations, the guy himself, his wife, and their three young kids under 10 years old. All of them needed to be eliminated. No survivors. Now that's the kind of job I typically avoid if possible. Not because of any ethical reservations on my part, but just because having kids involved tends to increase the operational complexity exponentially with all the extra cleanup required. Still, the cartel money was too good to turn down, so I negotiated a premium price and accepted. I spent over a month solid planning this one out, gaming out every possible contingency, surveilled the family's movements religiously, learned their schedules and routines inside and out. The logistical challenge was figuring out how to get all six targets neutralized at the same time, in the same contained location. Took some doing, but I worked out an airtight plan eventually. It involved hacking into the family's smart home system, overriding the security features, to let myself in one evening while they were all gathered in the living room. I'd come locked and loaded with a suppressed assault rifle, wearing body armor and night vision. One by one, I put a bullet cluster into each target's head before they ever knew what hit them. Over in seconds, with them all grouped up. But of course, that was just the start. The hard work comes in with the cleanup to make sure no trace evidence gets left behind. I spent over 12 methodical hours in that house afterwards, mopping up and going through my decontamination checklist to code. Bagged up the bodies, got them loaded into my van with a privacy cargo cover, and I slowly went over that house from top to bottom, triple checking every inch was sanitized. Loading the van back up, I drove those body bags out to a secluded mineshaft area I had already prepped in advance by renting a backhoe, dug a nice deep pit, dumped the bodies in and covered it over with dirt and debris. The van itself got rigged out with a removable plastic lining beforehand, so I just had to peel that liner out once I got back to my temporary residence, roll it up tightly and get rid of it washed the van inside and out before turning it back into the rental place. Probably went overboard, but you can never be too meticulous when it comes to not leaving any forensic traces. After all that was done, I finally felt that sense of relief and satisfaction wash over me, same as always when I complete a job. Sure, the subject matter had been unpleasant, to say the least but I had executed everything by the book, not a single step out of place in my procedures. That's what mattered. In the end, the cartel was plenty satisfied with my work and my total lack of a paper trail on that job. Guess those Sicarios had a newfound respect for just how comprehensive and cold-blooded a professional's methods can truly be when unshackled from normal human emotions or morals. I just saw it as another technical challenge successfully accomplished. People might find what I do abhorrent if they knew the details. But it's just business, a technical trade really. I don't make emotional judgments about the reasons for a job. I just obsess over executing it flawlessly to the client's specifications. Afterwards, I can finally relax and bask in the relief of OCD urges satisfied. So, yeah, maybe I've got a dark as fuck career, but it's kept me sane all these years, channeling my disorder into perfecting a very particular set of skills. At the end of the day, I've made peace with who I am. Because for me, this twisted shit is something close to normal. This is the curator, 
I hope you've enjoyed today's scary stories. Until next time.